Hey everyone, we're gonna give folks a minute to jump in. So this came out of uh, a DAS developer meeting. We have it do these every month. And we're like, it's just the developers talking to each other. Even as to talk to other people who are not just like core developers. I've also like, oh, people just want to give demos of like things they're working on and have a space for that. So we put those two ideas together and came up with demo day. So it seems like there are new people who I don't know, which is nice to see. Um, I'm gonna start off screen sharing just a bit for a second. No, stay here for a second. So uh, how this works, we've got five speakers today. Uh, Tom had to drop off, I'll fit in, fill in for Tom. Um, people have oh, 60 minutes divided by five, that's 12 minutes each, minus me uh, uh, chatting in between. Series. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. So uh, lightning talk should be like five to 10 minutes each. I'm gonna like cut you off pretty rudely at 10 minutes, I'll be watching a stopwatch. At least like a minute for questions, at least a minute for transition times. Uh, I'm going to share my screen briefly and we'll talk about who we're gonna to see today. So today uh, we're gonna to have Tom, Tom had a conflict. I'm gonna step in. Uh, I would like to start off things off with some kind of usage of Dask and then we'll go to different, different things. We'll then have, I think, Florian talking about task queuing. We'll have Jacob talking about Kubernetes stuff and Kubernetes operator, uh, Alex talking about Apache Beam on Dask. And then if we have time, I think Nat or David talking about Prometheus. So with that, I'm gonna get started. Um, so I'm gonna take it on the first spot uh, and I'm gonna hit this stopwatch. So I am off. Uh, fun little textual app, by the way, people should play with textual. So uh, I was chatting with Thomas Caswell and Thomas Caswell heard this thing that about 15% of papers on archive, which is a very popular uh, place to put papers, use matplotlib. Um, and we can actually test this because all the data for archive, all the papers are on S3. They're sitting here. So I'm playing with this archive bucket. Uh, and there's about three terabytes of data. It's about 5,000 directories. And you can just like, it's a bunch of tar files. You can write some really janky Python code to like navigate one of those tar files. And then for each PDF in the tar file, figure out if it has matplotlib in it. Uh, this is dual because matplotlib has started encoding the bytes matplotlib uh, in every PNG and PDF they produce. They've like watermarked all of the files that they produce, which is really neat. And so we can actually like scrape out the, uh, like the month and the year from the file name, and we can get um, a list of like every file and whether or not it included matplotlib. I'm running this on one of these 5,000 directories locally. And it's gonna take about a minute. And so we're gonna like feel that slowness. My goal is to process all 5,000 of these directories, all three terabytes in the span of this lightning talk. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes to do, it's about a minute per directory on my local machine, 5,000 directories, it's like hundred hours of total time. Um, actually it's a little bit worse because like the later ones are bigger. Archive got more popular over time. And so this would take me about a week normally. And again, we're gonna see if we can make it a bit, a bit faster. And I'm watching this clock. I've already burned two of my 10 minutes. There we go, a minute, 11 seconds, even worse. So what we get is, actually, while this is going on, I'm gonna run this. So for each of these directories, there's like a bunch of like, it's a tar file. In the tar file is a bunch of PDFs. Those PDFs have names like these. Uh, part of that name is the, I think the year and the month, I think this is like 2000 November. And it's got like the field, like here's like high energy physics experimental and whether or not it included matplotlib. In like this period of year 2000, none of these PDFs included the text matplotlib. And so it is not, not looking good for matplotlib. Um, I can make this a lot faster if I like move to where the data is. So I'm all the data is on US East one. Um, and also if I have not one Mac mini, which I'm working on, but 200 machines. Um, and so I'm asking for a bunch of, bunch of machines. This may be like a little bit of an implicit advertisement for Coiled. I apologize for mixing um, nonprofit, for-profit activities. But we're gonna sit here awkwardly and wait for a minute while all these machines show up. So I got the instances, and now we need to like install software on those instances. And I am at three minutes, three minutes, people.
I spoke really quickly. Any questions while I'm uh, while we're waiting here for a minute? Three and a half minutes. Do other um, plotting libraries like Bokeh also watermark that we're aware of? Yeah, we were thinking about this. Uh, Thomas actually proposed like some follow-ups, like you could look at other preprint servers, you could look at other plotting tools. Um, he's gonna like propose this as like a small intern project that maybe dumb focus will fund. But yeah, it's a great question. Okay, workers have arrived. Um, yeah, took about a minute, 55 seconds to get a cluster with mostly the right versions. And now we're gonna connect the dashboard up and we're going to map that extract function across all those directories. Um, yeah, so now we're off to like scaling that. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. Oh, while this is running, I was just gonna say, it's, it's a good thing we didn't get any positive map.lib results in the year two, year 2000. That, Why is that? Was map.lib not around then? I don't think it was. So that, okay. that, that would not have boded well for your analysis. Well, great. It's good to, uh, good to have the correct negative result. Um, so yeah, I'm like, you know, a little bit of the way through, it looks like 10% of the way through. Um, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. I might, in the interest of time, skip over to the end. So this is like the baking show. I'm going to show you the end result. So if you then like take all those things, you do some like pandas chicanery. To, so like once we have this data, we're done. We can close on the cluster. We then like modify stuff with pandas, do some more modifications, get some more information. Then we can plot. And we see that matplotlib is used by about 17% of papers today, which is fun. It's actually a nice result. Uh, Thomas Cather really likes this because he can go to like funding agencies and say like, see, uh, were used and like it's going up and to the right, like usage is increasing. And then Thomas, like a jerk, and said, like, Matt, that's a nice plot, but here's a much better plot. Um, and so he like did things more nicely. Um, so yeah, the data is actually all living. So I, I saved the results if you want to go and do some of the further analyses. I don't need to play with Dask anymore. Uh, it's all on this archive matplotlib um, repository. So I'll put that into the chat. How's Das doing? We're about halfway done, six minutes. I think I can finish in 10 minutes. But I'm just giving other people more time. I'm going to stop and yield control. I think is Florian around? I think he's up next. Yes, I'm around. Great. Um, great. Go, Florian. And it's right, like very briefly on the archive stuff. It was fun to like have some JK Python code and need to scale it out. I was like at a conference with Thomas and it was nice just to be like, oh, I know how to do that and and solve the problem. Uh, I think turning janky Python code and then like running over big scale problems is like what we do pretty well. And it was nice to run into that in the wild. So go Florian, time starting now. Great, all right. Um, I'm talking about task queuing, worker saturation, fixed memory scheduling. So these are all the buzzwords we're talking about. In the end, it's all about how does Dask not run out of memory? I have a couple of examples and basically I'm just showcasing a new configuration option that's soon uh, hopefully to be uh, up to uh, in, on, on by default. So I'm using uh, the most recent Dask version, so this was released about two, two weeks ago, and I'm also using Coiled um, just for convenience. In the interest of time, I already started a cluster, um, but yeah, I thought I wanted to save this minute. Um, for you know transparency's sake, I have a couple of utility function just to, functions just to create uh, data. This is just task stuff, um, nothing really fancy, and you can uh, get the code over here. So we have a task dashboard, and for starters, I'm, we will, so this is a cluster with about 150 gig. And what we will do is we actually, we will compute a very simple computation, at least from first principle, this looks very simple. We have two data frames. The one is about half the, the cluster size, so the one will be about 
75 gig, the other one uh, just half of that. We will combine both or we will subtract both and calculate, calculate a mean value. So this DF2 minus DF1 is actually a super trivial uh, example. At least it looks like it. And we can, uh, well, let's just schedule this first and then talk about what the actual, uh, what, what DASC is actually doing. So we'll just take a minute. This is in US East. I'm sitting in, in Europe, so there is some latency involved. Um, so we can see DASC is working off this, this computation. It will also actually succeed, but what we can also already see is that the bytes on the workers are actually building up significantly. And keep in mind, we are basically just subtracting data frames and calculating a mean value. Um, and this looks, doesn't look really great. So a lot of yellow here, yellow on the right-hand side, we're spilling stuff, there's network communication, a lot of memory is used, uh, the data distribution is skewed. So uh, a lot of, say, um, suboptimal things are happening. Um, if we look at the actual problem, this is not really straightforward. Um, this looks a little bit more complicated, but in, in a sense, what's happening is that we need to split the tasks, combine a little bit, uh, and only, only after we process through the bottom part, once we arrive at this data frame sum chunk stuff, we actually reduce data. Because in the end, what I expect as an outcome here is basically a, a single, single number. So we can reduce a lot of data, but somehow task, at least with the default configuration, um, is very um, um, inefficient and it takes a lot of time. And this is where we basically introduce a new parameter. This is currently off by default. It's called worker saturation. I also started a second cluster up with this um, and we can just wait for the initial one to finish uh, or maybe not. But what this will be doing is actually um, it will reduce the memory footprint here significantly. And why is, uh, I, I'll show in a second. So um, let's let's kill this, this earlier attempt. Um, this was awful. Um, and then we can watch both streams uh, together. So as I said, this uh, thing is already released. Uh, it's not yet um, on by default, but here is what you can expect to happen. So left-hand side is with the new configuration option, right-hand side, the default value. What you can see is that both are running, but on the left-hand side, we're actually consuming much, much less memory, no, almost nothing at all, actually. On the right-hand side, it's building up uh, more and more so. We will run into spilling later on. Um, what's the trick here is actually visualized here with this dashed um, shaded area here. Make time series, as you may know, is basically the function that generates data. In this case, random numbers, but in your case, it could be read parquet, read from Sal, something else. And what we are doing is we are artificially limiting how many of these tasks are actually running, which gives basically the entire system a little bit more time to breathe uh, and allows it to make much better decisions. And in the end, it's uh, walking through the graph um, well, very easily, uh, and we have basically almost no memory footprint. So this, this worker is spiking at 1.1 gig, while these are almost dying with more than 10 gig, and I'm processing the exact same data. This is the exact same computation left and right, just the one configuration not changed. We're currently working on making this actually the default uh, scheduling policy. Um, we are basically currently working through our CI system, um, so we don't expect anything major to pop up. Um, so either the next or the, uh, the, the release after that will, will have this enabled by default. But for those who are curious, you can already use this um, yourself right now. Just set the task configuration option and hopefully get a 10x speed improvement. So the first one already finished, the, the default one is still running. Um, yeah, there are other examples like this. Uh, so this was a data frame computation. Uh, actually, something that was submitted by, by a user was also something uh, in geoscience vorticity. A similar graph, it actually looks very relatively simple. We should just be able to walk through these branches. But in the end, it shows a very similar memory footprint and will perform awfully. This is actually all I wanted to show. So left, good, right, bad. 
um, soon to be new default value and very easy to, 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 to enable. We're also working on a blog post. There's, uh, for those who are interested, there's also GitHub discussion open if you want to leave feedback. So these are, say, this, this features the under active development, but it's already ready to use. So this is the test vorticity example, left-hand side running smoothly, right-hand side almost choking. Um, yeah, so this is what I wanted to show. I can ask, I can explain what's actually going on behind the scenes, uh, but otherwise uh, I'm not sure what's, what's the time. You're at seven minutes. Thank you, Florian. Uh, any questions? We have several minutes for questions. So I'll just like pause oh, here. I, uh, I'll, I'll restate the question I threw into the chat. And, I, and this is perhaps simplifying things too much, but does the right-hand side's pro poor performance come down to like haste makes waste to use an Anglophone <laughs> phrase? Uh, I, I don't know this, this phrase, but uh, if, <laughs> just to explain very briefly what's going on. Uh, you can actually see this in the task progress bar below uh, quite, quite easily. So uh, in the end, if we look at the right-hand side, uh, if you're not familiar with this coloring, the dark, um, the dark colored areas here basically show tasks in memory. So this is actual payload data that is cached on our workers and supposed to be used for a follow-up um, computation. This follow-up computation, this case is sub, that's the subtract part, df1 minus df2. And this is actually where we, just this operation reduces the memory you need to hold the memory by half. And from there on, it just goes down. So as soon as, the, the earlier we can run these subtraction tasks, the less memory we'll be, we'll be using. But for some reason, um, this is not working as efficiently. We are building up way too many of these reach and merge operations. And the workers are very eager to compute even more so. And basically, by on the left-hand side, we are artificially limiting how many of these tasks um, task is allowed to compute ahead of time. And this is this dashed area, which basically shows technically we could run these tasks, but we are, we are choosing not to. And this gives the entire thing much more breathing room, uh, much more memory to operate. We do not need to spill to disk. Right now, you see on the right-hand side, uh, the entire cluster is basically, well, standing still because it's just um, taking time to read and write uh, stuff to disk just to not go out of memory. And we are avoiding the situation entirely on the left-hand side by just not producing so much data. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but this is, this is a bit of the explanation behind uh, what's happening there. Thanks, Warren. Anyone else? Where can I find the config option to set? Um, so the config option is called distributed scheduler worker saturation. Um, if we look at the distributed dashboard, I would probably drop this in here as well. There's actually a nice discussion topic open that explains how you can set this easily. Now I need to find the chat again. Um, here it, goes. Um, it also, so it, it shows a couple of examples. So these are, for instance, memory pro, uh, samplings of a running cluster. And it also provides a couple of examples, depending on your deployment setup, how to um, set this config easily. Um, so please try this out, leave some feedback. We are happy to hear from you um, if this actually, you know, if you notice that something is slower or not behaving well, this is the kind of feedback we, we would like to hear. If everything works great, we will also be very happy uh, to hear from you. So give it a shot. Um, we hope to enable this soon by default. Lauren, there's one more question that I'm gonna cut you off uh, from Julian. What are sensible ranges for this setting? Yeah, so the very aggressive, I, I think the discussion goes into this, the very aggressive value is 1.0, which limits very strictly. And everything between one and two is actually something we can recommend and our default value would be some, somewhere there. As you saw, I set it to 1.1 uh, and this performs actually very great. Um, 
if you are too strict there, you might actually slow down performance a little, but generally it shouldn't matter too much. But one answer to that question is like, we don't know, and we're trying to benchmark things. Yes, so, so uh, people, should, <laughs> people should try it out and give, give feedback. Uh, I think right now the team is playing with it. Um, okay, Florian, that was great. Thank you. And I'm really excited about this work. Uh, kudos, I think, also to Gabe, who was working on this for a long time. Yes. Um, um, great. Next up, I think, uh, Jacob, I think you're, are you came to go? Yeah, let me, let me share my screen. Okay, I've clicked a thing. You should be able to see, uh, you can see what I'm sharing. Um, let me, uh, right. Okay, I'm gonna go for 10 minutes. I've got a time on my watch. So I, what I wanna kind of just show everybody is some of the work we've been doing in Dask Kubernetes lately. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to kind of throw away all of Dask Kubernetes and start again. Um, this is maybe the like fourth time we've done that as well since since like 2017 or whatever. So uh, it's exciting to be onto another iteration. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the reasons why I show it in action. So the new version of Dask Kubernetes is now uh, an operator based uh, model. So Kubernetes, you know, in case you don't know, Kubernetes is like this, this big orchestration platform for containers and things, but it has these really nice abstractions around data structures, storing data structures, taking action based on those structures, different lifecycle events. Um, and kind of what that boils down to is with the new implementation, we've implemented these, these uh, custom resources that represent a Dask cluster. They represent a group of workers. They represent all these kind of various things within Dask. And then we have this little controller application that lives in the cluster alongside the other Kubernetes controllers that makes things and deletes things and does all, all kind of nice stuff. It makes it a very nice uh, thing to interact with. And it also allows you to build really like composable things. So you can now use Dask resources as building blocks within building a larger application. Right? So if you're using Dask within something like Kubeflow, um, which is kind of what I'm going to focus on here, is like one of the, the motivating cases for us. Um, is Kubeflow is this really nice machine learning platform, which has a whole ton of tools, right? And it's built out of all these different building blocks and kind of composed together with Kubernetes um, to allow you to do your, your machine learning workflows. And I wrote a blog post about this a while ago. I'm going to kind of talk through some of the stuff in there. Um, and so this kind of general workflow, like reading data, preparing it, doing HPO, training models, ranking them, serving them. Kubernetes kind of provides this, uh, Kubeflow provides this like end-to-end -end way of doing this, right? You've got all these different tools you can link together. You can automate this as, as much as you want. You can kind of trigger model retrainings uh, like based on all sorts of events and do all sorts of kind of fun stuff with it. Um, but the kind of reading data, preparing data step often happens like in a notebook or as part of like submitting a, a, a workflow job that's doing pandasy stuff, num, numpy stuff. Um, and so Dask is like, that's like the clear place where Dask can slot into, into this existing kind of ecosystem and add some value. Um, but it's it's kind of, what's the word? Like it's it, up until now, it's not been the easiest thing to slot in. The original implementation of Dask Kubernetes kind of behaved like the uh, other cluster manager implementations, like local cluster, where it was creating sub processes. So your class would kind of spawn a, a scheduler and a worker and things, but kind of on something else. Whereas this is, we've kind of shifted to like a bit of a different model. So let me actually show you a bit of what I'm talking about. I'm going to skip over like all of this stuff. This is like how to get Kubernetes on your like local machine, which is kind of fine. In order to use Dask now uh, with the new operator, you need to install the controller itself and the custom resources. So you can do that in like a one line command here. I've already done it on my cluster. This gives you kind of the, the Dask operator running on your cluster. And if I just do like a, a key control get pods minus A or something, you should be able to see like, this is my, my Kube cluster. This is like all of Kubeflow installed here. I've got all the different operators doing all of the different bits and pieces you can see you know, CATIB and, and pipelines and all, the, all these different various sections. Jacob, sorry to interrupt, but at least for me, I only see your web browser. I don't see uh, Okay, Okay, that's fine. I will, rather than messing with the screen sharing in the interest of time, I'm not going to do too much oh. of that, but um, it's fine. I can do it all in Jupyter, which is fine. I've got six minutes. Um, so I have installed the Dask operator already, uh, and I can dive into, into Kubeflow, right? This is the, the Kubeflow UI. I can kind of log into that. I can spin up a, a, a notebook server. 
this is kind of, you know, Jupyter Hub does this. Like lots of things do this, gives you a notebook. And if I click through into my notebook, uh, let me grab a terminal, and then you'll be able to see the things I was trying to show. So I can do to control that pods in here. I can only see stuff within my user's namespace in, in Kubeflow in this situation. But you can see I've got my notebook, I've got some, some pipeline shrapnel kind of hanging around from other services. But because we have our Dask operator installed, I can do something like uh, Google Control get Dask clusters. Like type. And you know, this says no resources, but that's good. This would have, if if the operator wasn't installed, this would have said, like, I don't know what a Dask cluster is. So now Kubernetes knows what a Dask cluster is, and you can kind of treat it as like a native object. Now you can do all kinds of funky YAML stuff, and we can come onto that. But what you can also do in your notebook, if you click install Dask Kubernetes, uh, so you have it. I think I've probably already done this once, so it might just say that. I can now create a cluster kind of the, the regular way that most uh, of these tools would use. So let me uh, the operator and import cube cluster. I can do like cluster equals cube cluster. I have to give it a name. Let's call it like demo. Um, let me pop, I'm going to pop my terminal here and let's do like watch cube control dot pods. Uh, let's have another one of those actually. And do that launch. You can try and get Dask clusters. That's, that's short for Dask clusters. Um, if I make this in Python, you can see I have this, this demo scheduler appear here. Uh, let me slide it over and let me see that a bit better. So my demo scheduler pod has appeared. We have this demo cluster that's appeared, and Dask is kind of doing its, its normal thing. We've got our cluster representation. We can scale this up and down, you know, and scale to three workers with a nice widget. We should be able to see new pods just kind of appear in, in my Kubernetes cluster. This is kind of very similar to, to functionality we've had for a long time, but this is all now like Kubernetes native and completely decoupled from, from my notebook here. Um, so, you know, I can connect a client to this. I can do work with this. That's kind of all fine. I'm sure we've all seen that before. But like, I want to show some of the, the neat stuff we can do now. Like previously, this object was kind of tightly bound to this cluster. And that's kind of a bad thing because if I do like, a, you know, where's my notebook kernel? Uh, it's probably that one. If I do like kill minus nine on that, this is like a worst case scenario for old Dask Kubernetes and many of the other Dask deployment methods. If I just kill uh, my notebook, maybe it will not. Oh yeah, no, okay. I kill my notebook, things kind of explode. And I've now lost all of my references to all of my things um, and I can't necessarily clean up my Dask cluster. This is now like an unpleasant exercise. Uh, but now with the operator, I can just do the like, control get Dask clusters, and I can do uh, group control delete demo, that is Dask cluster demo. Uh, and we should see all those pods go into a terminating state. Everything kind of cleans up. This is nicely like separated. Um, I could also, if I magically have something I prepared earlier, uh, I have the, the YAML representation of that cluster, which you can find this in the documentation. It's a bit gnarly. If you really want to get under the covers of how Kubernetes stuff works, and you want, you, you probably will want to, to write this YAML, um, the Python API abstracts it all away. But we could also do like kube control uh, apply minus uh, cluster.yaml. And I can recreate that same Dask cluster, but in a very Kubernetes native way here now. And this is kind of where the power of this really fits in with orchestrating it with other tools, uh, building it with other workflows. I know this is being integrated into Flight at the moment, which is like a popular workflow manager in, in the Kubernetes world. Um, and so that's pretty neat. This cluster exists, but this links back into the Python world. So I can also, if I create a Dask cluster, also called demo, I immediately just connect to it. That cluster already exists. So we don't need to create that. We just connect, we can do all of our things. And then that kind of composability has allowed us to make some, some other nice resources. So we have, uh, our auto scaling, our like cluster.adapt behavior now lives in Kubernetes. Kubernetes speaks to the scheduler and, and handles that outside of your notebook session, um, which is kind of neat. And I also have this Dask job uh, controller, which is really cool, where you can create a Dask cluster alongside the actual workload you want to run, right? This is my Python script that's going to do import a client, create a client with no config, because we inject that at runtime into the, the, the pod by environment variables. I just have my kind of business logic of what my workflow wants to be. And the, the Dask operator handles creating a Dask cluster alongside that, your work scales out. And then when your pod finishes, when your workload finishes, it scales down the Dask cluster. This is kind of like using the with 
you know, cube cluster within a Python session, but this is kind of outside of that. This is like a, a Kubernetes native way of doing that. So I've probably got, I've got like 50 seconds left. That's kind of a, a general overview of, of what I wanted to say. Go and check out the blog post because it's kind of all, all in there. Uh, there's like a, a lot of fun stuff. Um, so if you play around with Kubernetes or is particularly using Kubeflow, then uh, go and check out the new operator. That's great, super exciting. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. I've got one. Um, super awesome work. Like we've, we've been taking advantage of all the Dask Kubernetes stuff and it's been awesome. Um, and right now everybody on the team's using Helm to deploy their own custom uh, Dask uh, clusters, which is, which is cool, but it's kind of funny for a data scientist to be running any Helm commands. Uh, but it's been, it's been so amazing for us. Uh, and I remember at one point we looked into the Dask operator, um, or sorry, the, what, what is it called again? The Dask cube yeah, probably, cluster. Probably the operator, what I was showing them. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, I, there's two implementations, right? You might have looked at the old one if this was more than like a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think so. But I think I think when it when it just came out, it did it didn't really support um, providing an image. Can you now provide um, like the repo to the container that you want to use to spin up the? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I have to, I have to reinvest it. I have to investigate this again, because I think it'd be much simpler than having everybody um, build, de deploy and, and delete uh, with, with, with Helm. So yeah, thanks for all the work. Very cool. Yeah, sure. I think one of the things I'm kind of keen to do at the moment is like, um, we have like the Dask Helm chart, right, which just creates like a scheduler, some workers and a Jupyter pod. But like now that the operator exists, we could just create a Jupyter pod and a Dask cluster resource and kind of treat it as like a native object. So folks could still use Helm, but they can get all the like benefit of, of using the operator as well. But yeah, feel free to raise issues, ping me on things. I'm, I'm excited to have folks using it, so. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, another use case was, I think, yeah, we also use Flight and I'm sure you've heard some noise maybe from Bernard who's, who's helped contribute a little bit there. Um, but right now we use this Dask plugin which has a very fixed amount of resources, but instead, if we used the operator, it'd be a lot simpler to parameterize the resources depending on the work or the job type. So this also might be very useful there too. Yeah, I think that Dask job resource particularly is gonna be useful in flight because you, the, the Dask cluster is kind of created adjacent to the, the workload part that you're running. Cool, okay, thank you, Jacob. Uh, quick logistical point, Nat, you sent me an email saying you have like a scheduling conflict. Um, do you want to go now or do you want to go after Alex? Um, I could go now if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Alex, does that work for you? That... Cool. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thanks. Go Sorry. Um, let me make sure I can share a screen. Thank you, Jacob. Dude, that was great. Okay. Um, so I've been working lately on Prometheus for Dask. Um, Dask already has a Prometheus endpoint. It exposes some metrics. Um, people can see a screen. This is what the metrics look like. Um, not very interesting, but it's a lot of count data. A lot of this is the same sort of data you could get from the existing um, dashboard in real time. Dashboard gives you a lot more. But what Prometheus gives us is a way to persist that data for past clusters and then programmatically look at that, make comparisons, do other interesting things with the data. Um, so I was going to demo um, some things that we've been doing with this data at Coiled and with the benchmarks we're running and some other things. Um, <clears throat> So Prometheus runs on the instances. It's exporting metrics. We then have agents that are collecting these metrics, basically putting them in a Prometheus database and then have a Grafana server that lets us create nice dashboards for this data. So let's see. Yeah. Um, I'm bad at screen sharing. Let me make this go away. Um, so just an example, here is what our dashboard looks like for um, <clears throat> one of the benchmarks that ran 
earlier this morning. This was doing some parquet tiles. Um, we can easily zoom in on different parts of the workload. Um, what we get here is both uh, hardware metrics from the host and also the, those DAS metrics. Um, so we can see things like CPU and memory from the host. We can also see things like occupancy, um, cluster memory broken down, but even things like task counts broken down by um, state, but also uh, by task group. Um, some of this we've actually been adding to Dask what metrics is exporting so we can make these dashboards better. Um, so I was going to show a, a couple specific cases. Um, this, for instance, is um, so this is a, a workload that's specifically spill heavy. You can see what that looks like. Um, so for one thing, uh, we can see there's a lot of spill. We can see how much spill. We can see spill over time. Um, one interesting thing that we discovered by having both um, the Dask and the host metrics. So we run um, we run multiple benchmark tests on the same cluster, and we restart it uh, during those tests. One thing I noticed was that there were actually gaps in the metrics we were getting from Dask. Um, so that's like this area here on the workers. And often when you have, so things block the event loop and that can prevent you from collecting Dask metrics. Um, but we still have hardware metrics. So we do have some insight into what's happening. And it, it turns out in this case, because it's spill heavy and then we're doing a restart, it was actually, um, we found while deleting files, blocking the event loop. Um, and so you can see as the disk, util, uh, the disk space, disk amount written on disk goes down um, is the period of time in which the event loop was blocked. Um, so that was an interesting thing. Um, let me see. So another thing I was going to show was um, something I looked at. We recently changed the EC2 instance types that we were uh, running our benchmarks on from um, instance types that were burstable, T3s, to um, instance types that were not burstable. So you get a fixed amount of CPU utilization. Um, and we noticed uh, this actually made the tests run a lot faster. It's curious why. So um, let me see what else I'm going to look at. A nice one. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so he, here's a nice one. Um, so these are times. And we can actually bring up um, now a list of all the runs of this. And I'm going to look at one of these earlier long times there and compare a recent short time. So we have now for our um, benchmark test runs the ability to, to pull up after the fact the Grafana dashboard showing that test run. Um, so in this case, this is um, basically doing some array operations. Um, it's, you know, you can see it's using memory. It's moderately CPU heavy workload. Um, and a really interesting thing that we noticed, I noticed was that on the burstful instance types, um, we actually have a lot of CPU time that ends up being used on steel and this on uh, AWS is for burstable instances. A big part of this time is basically them figuring out how much you need to pay for that bursting. Um, whereas we can compare the exact same test 
run on the different instance type and steel is basically zero. Um, and it turned out that that made a significant difference in the uh, test time. Those are some things. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's great. Questions okay. about any Next of that? Time. Any questions? Can you bring up the Grafana dashboard? Can you share your screen again, Matt? Sure, maybe. Uh, nice keyboard. Yeah, I was thinking two things I want to pull out. Um, thinking about Florian's talk and like watching the like the amount of memory going through a cluster, and like we're actually seeing that story in the lower right plot, like the the width of that blue section on task counts is what like the work that Florian mm. was talking about. And so like presumably like we should see that change over time. And as as we're looking at sort of previously failed clusters that have failed, like that's a thing that we can go and we can play with. We can go look at that. Oh, like the like the the band of, of active memory tasks should be thin. This seems like a good enough workload. Oh, it is increasing over time, which is a little bit strange. Um, the thing I wanted to to bring up was uh, the work you recently did on task groups. Can you show that? Um, yeah, that on the upper right, like the the plot everyone loves is the uh, is a task stream plot, and like I would love to have the task stream plot for every cluster ever. But we like can't put that into Prometheus, but this is actually like a pretty good proxy. We can see that like over time we're blending between you know getting items, random sample, rechunking, kind of smoothly, and this this tells part of the same story the task stream tells, but now for every single workload we've ever run. And so it's nice having that kind of data around. I'm excited about about this and about the different like stories we can figure out. So I just want to call those two things out. Other questions? If not, then you're released. Thanks, Nat. Alex, beam. Hey everyone, um, I have some slides that I'm happy to share. Uh, let me see, see this. Can you see my uh, presentation? We can. Share. Yes. Let me do. Uh, let me share my entire screen just for the ease. Um, okay. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Alex Moroz. Uh, I work at Google Research, and I'm here to talk about Apache Beam on DAS bags. Uh, so as a you know, first introduction, what is Apache Beam? Um, Apache Beam is trying to be the API for big data in general. It's like a really pluggable framework or programming model that lets you bring your own programming language uh, and you know, distributed computing SDK and then execute it in whatever environment uh, like fun underlying environment that you want to execute. Um, a lot of Dask right now is oriented around <clears throat> uh, Flink or a GCP service called Dataflow or Apache Spark, um, where you can write in any language and kind of deploy uh, in the underlying frame, you know, under, in the underlying system. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about something that I've recently contributed uh, just for the Python ecosystem, where I have uh, you know, use the allowing, I'm trying to make it so that users can use the beam programming model uh, to translate beam graphs into DAS graphs, and then to, from DAS graphs, let you execute them on uh, what, what, something I developed, a DAS runner, which would let you deploy, um, you know, beam pipelines on DAS distributed. Um, so just, uh, you know, take even further of a step back, I want to talk about the difference between tasks or, you know, graphs in both Dask and Dataflow or in uh, the Dataflow model, um, which, which Beam uses. Um, and I really like this illustration from the Dask docs. Um, you know, Dask is, uh, the, I think the atomic unit of Dask, as I understand it, are graphs of tasks. Um, whereas Beam has maybe a, a bit more information in its construction of parallel work. Um, Beam defines uh, work as graphs of operations and data. And uh, a main reason of this behind this is, uh, you know, in, in the Beam world of view, um, both 
the underlying data and the operations on it are part of the same concern. So it's, it's taken into account explicitly and upfront. Um, and in the end, user actually defines uh, both the graph of, of collections, you know, the called P collections and operations. Um, so Beam just for reference is kind of like maybe the MapReduce type of paradigm, whereas DAS really lets you do any of these paradigms. Um, yeah, I just, just to illustrate what I mean by this, this is this has all been very abstract. I want to be a bit more concrete. This is a um, Beam pipeline. Um, this is implements word count, you know, with a canonical example of, of distributed computing. Um, and this is a, a fully working program that kind of runs in, it could, could run in an execution environment. Here you'd pass in into this uh, pipeline object um, where you'd like to run it. The execution environment is called a runner. Um, and all this does is it reads a corpus of documents. It flat maps it uh, into a series of words. It maps each word to uh, a single token and uh, you know, the number one. Uh, and then the token acts as a key and you combine for a key and sum all the single ones. Uh, then you print out the tuple pair of uh, words and sums, and then you write that to a document. And, and that's kind of how Beam works. I mentioned that Beam has a, a graph of uh, operations and data. Um, that's kind of what this pipe operator does. You, you can actually assign a variable to every one of these operations, the, this whole read lines and this, this uh, operator here, and then the operation. Um, operates on things, you know, this pipeline is a, 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 you know, a placeholder for a parallel collection or a P collection. Um, and that's my really brief introduction to uh, kind of how Apache Beam works. I'm happy to go more in depth if people have, qu have questions. Um, before I do, um, you know, I'd like to talk about the, the recent contribution I made, which was um, translating P collections into DAS bags. Um, DAS bags and P collections basically have the same interface. So uh, a good reflection of that was that this this is the core of the the Apache you know Apache Beam's Dask runner the the thing that basically translates and then executes um, this is the part that translates uh, you know the the Beam model into Dask and it's about you know 25 lines of code and all it really does is it uh, you know on a visitor um, node in a graph of operations uh, you kind of like check uh, the operations look at uh, you know the, the previous operations and kind of plug one in, into the other. It's like, you know, a very set, simple set of, of transformations that are standard for iterating through graphs. Um, and what this visitor does more or less is it translate, uh, translates all uh, beam operations into four core uh, DASP ag extractions. So to create something, you, you go from, you know, nothing, this is going to be uh, none into a sequence of, of the items. We could get the data cached uh, somewhere in, in beam. Uh, you go from sequence, and then if you want, you can optionally do a parallel uh, like map operation. This is, these are kind of an abstraction on all embarrassing parallel tasks. Uh, generally, it's kind of like an abstract flat map type of interface, like you know, the more traditional uh, flat map. Um, so that's why it's a map and a flatten. Um, and then the other two operations that are needed to you know, run pretty much everything that you need to in Beam are this group by key, which is, you know, that has the core reshuffle operation and, you know, the, it, it, it takes things from the embarrassing parallel paradigm into a set of, uh, you know, kind of reduces them into a set of new collections. And that's really just as a, a simple interface of, um, it's a basic combination of group by and map, but, you know, really like it's taking in a set of tuples and, and uh, uh, keys and, and uh, you know, their, their tokens. And then the last operation you need, which is more of like a, I guess extra detail that, that kind of uh, cleans things up is just a flatten, which we actually implement as concat. And um, from there, uh, you know, you like we basically have uh, you know simple pipelines. I believe word count works, um, but like we have we have kind of a minimum viable uh, uh, ability to run Beam pipelines on Dask. And um, let's see if I have any uh, things. I, I would demonstrate this. I, I had it working on my machine a few weeks ago. I upgraded to an M1 Mac, and now uh, everything is broken. So I can't, I can't share my screen and demo something to you. But I'm happy to take questions uh, right now. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Any questions? I've got a few, but I'll wait. Okay, questions. So Beam like handles streaming data. That's like the in my mind, that's like a thing that's part. That's like part of it. Bag does not. 
like are you just like doing lots of little bad computations what's what's happening there um yeah that's a good question uh you know i think one thing that i really like about how you can build dask runners is that you can add on uh things as needed so you actually you know like you, you, there's a capabilities matrix you can add on features as is needed um basically like haven't addressed how that would work yet. Uh, and I'm, I'm open to ideas or collaborating with the, the Dask developers and like how to solve streaming. Um, maybe what we would do is, um, you know, have, have more logic in the runner to handle the streaming case, or we could have it uh, work for batch operations only. Um, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? Otherwise I get to keep grilling, Alex. Would love to be grilled. Um, I, I'm happy to. I, I've mainly been, um, you know, hanging out or talking to all the the Beam folks, and this is kind of my first time talking to all the Dask folks. So, welcome. Um, would love to have more of a, a dialogue. Of two questions, one technical, which is like, how about features? Maybe Dask features is a way to do some of these things, but maybe it's more complicated. I don't know. And the second question is why? Like, why did you get into this? Was there something you could tell you could do? Is there like some user active who's like curious about it? Like what's the what's the motivation? Some people here might be familiar with the Pangeo Forge project. And if not, just as a brief introduction, uh, you know, Pangeo data, you know, they make things like X-ray and contribute to Dask. Uh, Pangeo Forge is this um, like data engineering framework that's trying to be the conda forge of data sets. And uh, they have a problem where they were basically trying to be a compiler to distributed execution frameworks where um, they wanted to deploy on Dask, but also on other environments, uh, including Beam, but on Limited 2 and you know, yet another framework. Um, but a lot of that kind of um, a lot of that complexity or that that problem is solved by Beam directly. Beam itself, like I showed you the, the visitor, it is a it is basically like a distributed computing engine compiler framework. The the big kind of cost is that you need to adopted programming model, but the programming model ultimately lets you just write Python. Um, kind of like Spark, you can write Dask inside Beam and, and things like that, or, or vice versa. Um, so the, the reason why this exists is that um, Pangeo Forge needs to, would like to deploy its, you know, batch pipelines on Dask as like a core uh, environment in which to um, do data engineering. Okay, cool. Other questions? So I'm curious, like this, they, this comes up like from time to time for me around Beam, but like usually the other way around of like, how can we set Dask on top of Dataflow or something and reuse the runner, but with like the Dask API. And this seems to be like the other way around of like, how can we put the Beam API on top of the Dask scheduler and like a Dask cluster. I'm kind of just curious, like, I mean, I, mean, I know we can chat to the Pangeo folks, but like, I'm curious about the motivation there behind, like you have Dataflow already, right? Like it's, it's what is Dask giving over like an already adopted like service like that? Yeah, you know, um, I guess, you know, like another similar runner to Dask that I see, um, like Ray is another distributed framework that you might say, well, we already have Spark, but like we want to deploy on Ray or another environment. Um, I guess like, a, you know, a, a big selling point of, of Beam is that it's highly portable and that you can kind of like work with any environment that, that you have and, and bring it there. But um, I would say beyond, you know, working in the cloud, a lot of, as I understand, a lot of HPC has set up their compute environment to run on Dask where, where they have, you know, um, you know, they, they can use, uh, like have a, a, you know, bespoke Dask cluster, um, working on their, their supercomputers. Uh, this would basically allow, um, kind of like a model designed, a programming model designed for big data and the cloud to also just maybe more seamlessly run on HPC if we can get it more mature and I think that, um, you know, maybe I think you know for for a lot of those types of users, uh, you know, it'd probably be hot, harder for scientists to adopt, like the cloud model deploying on you know whatever cloud. But um, maybe you know they could use the same kind of programming model and, and still use their their infrastructure. Hmm. That makes loads of sense. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Alex. 
Um, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you all for coming. This is the first time we did this. It seems like it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun for lots of folks. I wanna point people at two things that are in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to give a talk next month, we plan to do this every month, sort of in the middle of the month. Um, there's a doc uh, which has uh, signups for November. Uh, no experience or fanciness necessary. Please help to lower the bar. Um, come in, show how you're using things, show things breaking, be a five minute talk. So I think the talks they were more prepared than they need to be. So again, please feel free to like come in just like with some issue, that'd be fun. Uh, and then also uh, we'll announce these, we tend to announce things on GitHub. Uh, so like where we have a lot of conversation. If you watch the Twitter feed, we'll be there, but also you could watch uh, the GitHub repository at dask slash community. Lots of other things get announced there. So two calls to action at the end. Uh, any further comments anyone wants to make? I had a quick comment, Matt, if that's okay. I, Go for it. I was thinking about Nat's Prometheus demo, and I, I wanted to mention that I, I kind of think of this demo from two perspectives. There's like the Dask user perspective, where you, this is all stuff you can do as any Dask user to set up, uh, use the Prometheus endpoint, set up a Grafana, look at the stuff Nat was looking at. There's also the cluster manager perspective, where Coil and any other cluster manager is, is doing some stuff to make that easy. So. Coil is thinking about that. Other cluster managers could think about that. We're we're trying to make it, all that stuff easy for a user to kind of get nice views automatically. But those are also all views that a user could get put together themselves, given what exists right now. It's kind of both perspectives. Mm -hmm. Cool. For example. Jacob, with Kubernetes work, we could like start thinking about how to do that better with the Kubernetes platform and make that more pleasant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. We do some. We oh, I was just going to chime in there. We do something similar. We actually forward a lot of the Kubernetes-based deployment information to Datadog, um, and that's how we sort of view like our resource utilization. And we also take advantage of cube cost. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Um, but yeah, it's sort of like another way to just show like CPU utilization. It actually, it's, it's trying to give you an overall cost per deployment by namespace, which has been really useful, something mm -hmm. to check out. Okay, thank you everyone. This has been great. Cheers. Thanks for organizing this, Matt. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.